traditional buildings. They comprise of vertical walls, horizontal roofs. The Bear project is quite different. The walls are curved, the ceiling's curved, the facade's curved. We knew that this job was going to be extremely challenging, not just in terms of architectural design, but also in terms of construction. It's a Zaha Hadid project. It's got a lot of curves to it. It has not been easy to adapt to that curved nature. There is a clash between the culture of the designer and the culture of the contractor, and that's where you tend to get problems. Within 15 years of experience, I have never seen such level of acceptance criteria. This practice is not very common in this region, and we're basically pushing our boundaries to achieve that. One of the areas that Sharjah wants to lead in, Sharjah wants to be the environmental capital of the region. In 2009, BIA was approximately 40 employees. Today, we're over 5,000 employees and still expanding. We looked at initially the problems of waste. We have the highest generation of waste per capita in the world here in the GCC and in the UAE. So that is the first problem we tackled. But we also look at the water quality. We also look at the air quality. We're looking at waste management from the collection of waste to the recycling treatment of waste, conversion of waste into energy, also renewable energy. So this is the objective of BIA, to tackle the challenges that are faced here in the Middle East, at the end, to create a better life for the future. So with the vision of BIA and where we're going to showcase uh, the DNA of, of wh what we're looking at and where we're going, we had to build an iconic structure that had to reflect our DNA. It uses renewable energy, 100%. It uses recycling material. It's a very modern building, which is a, being a very innovative company, so it reflects who we are. BIA was looking for a proposal that would embody its sustainable vision, but at the same time create an iconic landmark for the city of Sharjah. So Zaha Hadid was among three other international architects which competed for the design of the headquarters. And upon submitting their proposal, it was evident that the Zaha Hadid design integrated BIA's vision for an environmental building which sits seamlessly within its context by the desert and mimics the sand dunes which are surrounding it while creating an architectural icon for sustainability. And that's why they won the competition. So we wanted to be very careful and very conscious that what we are proposing reflects completely the client's brief and the client's mission. So for us, the first finding of our research was the environmental criteria that we need to apply in our design. And these are reflected in the shape of the building, the circulation, the internal program and program distribution within the building. The project we're talking about here, one of the themes which have characterized the innovations which Zaha brought into the discipline was the idea of architecture to be construed in analogy formally and conceptually to landscape formations. So where we have soft transitions, forms being changeful, adaptive, natural formations, in this case dune formations, rocks and water formations. The way nature evolves forms which are adaptive, changeful, varied, but always principled and rational according to performance criteria. This has been a great inspiration. Working with such a character and a genius architect like Zaha uh, is a dream. And uh, I think Zaha, through her career and through her methodology, he managed to plant the DNA of her creativity and her thoughts in everybody who worked with her. And uh, having her from the Middle East as a background was something to be proud of. And how she managed to push the boundaries and establish herself at the top of the architectural schools and practices in the world. In the competition, we were a very, very small team at the beginning. We were four designers being led by Saha and Patrick with the supervision of Tarek. It was something that, that we had not done before as a company. And personally, I had never worked on a project of this scale. We had about three weeks of really intense days and nights working to produce the final images for the presentation to the client. 
What we specifically looked at was how, if you have these sand dunes, what would water do to affect and, and carve out these spaces? So we tried to create these elements that were functional for people to use as a building, but then also quite natural in how the wind and everything shapes those and, and use that as inspiration for determining the design of the project. We understand that there are certain limitations in constructability, but at the same time we want to make sure that we're pushing the boundary as much as we can, not just in the architectural sense, but also in the construction scene. The open landscape was the most exciting aspect of the project and makes it a unique project with an art portfolio. That means the silhouette of the buildings becomes incredibly important. The site specificity of, of creating that elegant silhouette in that landscape as you move around it and past it, you will experience those forms. One of the most dramatic spaces that a visitor would see is this lobby uh, space with the in-situ concrete dome and these coffer LED lighted boxes that have this Arabic light pattern and it created this fluid element that you feel as if you're in, in this space that could be constantly in flux and not a static thing as you would think of a normal building. The building matches be uh, in a sense that we are always keeping in mind recycling as well as reusing energy and limiting the amount of energy they will be using as a building. The way that this was then reshaped into part of the design is that the building is oriented in a particular way to take advantage of the prevailing wind. Also, the way that we have angled the walls on the exterior of the building in a sense that not only provide an aesthetic solution, but also they provide a shading device for the internal spaces. The roof has been panelized in a triangulated way, almost if you think of pixelating a uh, double curved surface. The reason for doing this is so that we could potentially use glass reinforced concrete panels and we would be able to still generate and maintain the overall silhouette of the building while at the same time being able to use potentially the same mold for some of these panels. Again, sticking to BIA's initial idea and core values of reusing, recycling and limiting the amount of waste. I think the building addresses a lot of architectural uh, challenges as well as sustainable challenges. And the context of the building, which is the desert, poses a very interesting challenge as well for designing it, for constructing it. For me as an engineer, a Zahadid project has always been interesting because it's not about making a shape work. It is finding that synergy between the engineering and the architectural formal expression. And when it really comes together, it becomes something very, very beautiful. There's an incredible sense of beauty at play here, which Zaha brought into the discipline, the purity of the form, and showing that we can treat a work environment, corporate headquarters, with the same sense of dignity and elegance and beauty, like one would expect otherwise, perhaps only for kind of a sacred space. It was a very proud moment for all of us. We've been working on the design for two years and for actually to groundbreak and be on site, it meant that this is real, this is going to happen. We're starting construction, um, so it was a very surreal moment. Well, today is a very important day because it comes two weeks after the ground break we had, and this is one of our first intense sessions of a long journey of interaction and serious discussion between the design team, the contractors, the subcontractors, and the consultants, trying to roadmap the work process for the, for the next two years of construction. The, the process has been quite pervasive already. Right? We've, we've had a pre-construction phase 
where we had AFC, the, the main contract involved already, because the building's so complex. So we needed real buildability information from the contractor. We're, we're all used to building little square boxes or rectangular boxes, and this one is, is, a, is a little different, it's a little unusual. There's no one part of this building which is the same. Every, every element is, is different, and that's what makes it difficult. There's nothing repetitive at all in the, in the build. The walls are curved, the ceiling's curved, the facade's curved, the materials are different, you know, there's different ways of doing things. Traditional buildings, they comprise of vertical walls, horizontal roofs, or simply pitched roofs. The Bear project is quite different. It, it's a more natural form. You need to marry traditional construction techniques, like having columns and beams, to having a free-flowing roof and that's the challenge. We've got a few issues that we've picked up through uh, modelling in depth uh, the, the scheme. We'd have a bit of tension around the place where they try to solve new things. It's a lot down to the complexity of the project and after a, a lot of analysis by the team they've identified the areas we need to look at in more detail and, and sort it out. Uh, John, you are looking at it from this side but if you look at it from the other side you see this angle definitely is more than far. Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. So it means that this area you cannot use because it is more than 15 degrees. So, 15 degrees. Yes. So if you see here, it is more than 15. This is more than 15, definitely. Jeez, we're not talking about here. Here, for sure, we might, we will exceed 15 degrees. John, not the only longitudinal direction. In any direction, if it is more than 15, then it cannot be used. Right there, there is a clash between cultures, the culture of the designer and the culture of the contractor, because the construction industry is still not geared towards providing buildings that have unusual form, and that's where you tend to get problems. At this moment, there's a lot of coordination going on because the steel structure is supposed to be up in a couple of months, also the concrete structure as well. So there's a lot of focus on that, but how to coordinate it with other disciplines and the substructure and all that needs to come afterwards. It's a very tight schedule, so it really needs us to find the right solution and the best way forward. That's what we need to really look at together. The internationally renowned woman architect Zaha Hadid has died of a heart attack at the age of 65. The, in the hospital British... in Miami, the architect... Zaha Hadid, arguably the world's best-known female architect, certainly probably the most successful. Her influence today is reflected in major works around the world. I was due to fly out that evening. And it just so happened that I had my, my laptop on and I saw the, the, the message that Zaha had passed. It was a shock for me, for the client and for the contractor. I mean, everybody at Zaha was shaken when, when Zaha died. Zaha was the one who held the team together. I still remember the, the minute when I received that call there was a meeting with, with Patrick and myself, the team members, and actually start to think, what do we need to do? It was quite emotional, that's true. These are the, the last projects of Zaha, and that's the way they're perceived, and that's the way they will be looked at. And I feel a strong responsibility. There's a lot of expectation also, and to realize the project as she envisaged it. I think our first milestone is to complete the foundation works because then you get to see the outline of the building when you're looking at it from an aerial view. The second milestone is the concrete dome, which is a crucial part of the project. We're all crossing our fingers that um, once the shutters come out, um, that the concrete will look as perfect as we imagined. And this is one of our biggest challenges, basically, to make the right calls on materials, on finishes, on colors. We have been the early design stage with BIA team, with Bur Hapold, with Zaha Hadid. We explained to them that what have been drawn is practically cannot be built with their expected requirement. 
So several developments, several workshops to reach the system where we are right now. So we have constructed a visual mock-up on site. So accordingly, they can see the return, they can choose the colors of the glass, agree on the finish of the steel itself. Just making sure the consistency of the concrete is correct has been a real challenge for everyone. And we've been developing that over a long period of time. In fact, we started the mock-up about a year ago prior to casting on site. And there's been a lot of learning involved in that. Behind us, it's not the first time we've actually showed the mock-up to them. We've involved the, uh, the client and design team all the way through as soon as we struck the dome mock-up. We found out things from them in doing that. that immediately, we were alerted to the fact that they didn't like the colour of the concrete. Although that's a, just a natural product and specified as, as natural concrete, they wanted actually a particular colour. The dome is an extremely difficult piece of architecture and engineering. We have been trying to do as many tests as possible in order to make sure that we get it right, because once we go on site, we only have one time that we can do this. If either it goes right or it goes wrong, and we want to make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. What is beyond interesting is not only this concrete dome is an exciting, fair-faced uh, architectural piece in the center and a major feature, but it's also holding the steel structure of the roof. It's quite challenging to have such a large visual piece of concrete in the main entrance. There are no straight lines in that dome whatsoever. It's all curved. Because of the complex nature of its form, and our idea of it being the seamless concrete dome makes us nervous because this practice is not very common in this region and we're basically pushing our boundaries um, to achieve that. Once it's cast and the moment of truth is once these shutterings come off the concrete and we finally see if we've achieved the fair-faced concrete uh, finish that we have envisioned for ourselves. There's not a straight line on the project. For me personally, um, it's a real challenge. Um, it's out in the middle of the desert. We have camels walking by. We have snakes that we find on site. Uh, we have a particularly challenging project to deliver. Another challenge is pouring concrete in summer um, because it's very harsh out there and temperatures rise. And so pouring concrete and then striking the shutters off but the concrete might react differently um, when it's in hotter months. The people, the operatives who are casting the concrete are working in high 40 degree temperatures, which is not good for them. And it's also not good for the concrete. Because concrete, as it hydrates, it gains heat. So they would typically start casting the dome about midnight when it's coolest, and they would take mitigation measures to cool the concrete down as much as possible. The third milestone is for the steel structure to come up, because then you, you get to see the curvilinear form of the building starting to shape up. At the moment on the project, the structural steel is particularly challenging with the geometry of the building, so it's a lot of curves involved. We have about 60% of the structural steel standing. The next couple of months that will be complete, and you'll see the complete shape of the building. And also, we have final preparations for the last of the concrete dome, from the complex geometry which the shuttering needs to follow. We have the, the concrete dome, which we're going to pour tonight, which is a really massive uh, milestone for all of us here on the site. Um, the coordination of that information to get it to this point has been intense. What this pro represents is the, is the closing out of the dome, the finishing of the dome, which is architecturally a focal part of this, of this project. It's the first thing you see when you enter. Um, and what it also does then is it frees up the rest of the structure around it. We've been running a night shift for the last two months for pouring concrete so we can get the best results. So doing that, and we'll do our last one this evening. We need to ensure that we have power into the building and we have wild air on to make sure that the temperature in the building is 
where it needs to be so we can start putting up some of the internal finishes. Because the shape of the building, the dome, is double curved and to hold the concrete on the top core, it was really tough. So we have to go step by step and it took us about 12 hours every day to do the concrete. And the dome came out beautifully, which is a very ambitious piece. Very large, tall dome, nearly 18 meters tall. It's a beautiful surprise. Suddenly this silhouette appears, swelling up and coming down again beautifully. Today we're celebrating the topping out ceremony, when we hit the highest point in the structure. It's a very proud moment, to be honest, to stand underneath that structure after all of the attempts and research it went through, especially to have everyone who's worked on this project to celebrate a moment like that. It was also an emotional moment because for most of us, we imagined this day would come and Zahalid uh, would be joining us for this event. She passed away when we were in the middle of the process. And actually this gave a push not only to us as Ad architects, but to the entire project team that we owe this to Zaha. These are the, the last projects of Zaha, and we feel the duty and the positive energy to realize them uh, to the kind of perfection she was always insisting on. Experience, working with her and seeing her in these kind of situations, she had a very big heart, and um, that was always felt in Zaha politics. But underlying that is Zaha's big influence. I still miss him. So now we've seen the skeleton of the building and the structure that holds everything together. Um, and the coming few months, you'll start seeing, um, you know, the decking, the cladding, the GRCs. The main items that we've completed uh, were the structural steelwork, which is an incredibly complex piece of engineering, and also the concrete dome, which is very complicated, probably one of the only ones like it in the world. Uh, the next steps now are to start finishing off the envelope so we can get to a position where we can get what we call wild air into the building, which means that we push cold air or conditioned air to the building and we can start on some of the finishes. Because in this part of the world, putting finishes in a building in this sort of environment, you need to control it. So currently we are putting the decking on the roof for some rope access guys up there, starting to put what looks like cementitious board on the building. And that's the next layer of the roof build-up that they're now going to start constructing. A multi-skinned roof system. This building is quite unusual because traditional buildings, they have four elevations and a roof. Nobody cares what the roof looks like normally. Mechanical plant up there, what have you. This building is quite different because the roof becomes the fifth elevation of the building and is the most important elevation of the building. The aspirations of achieving the LEED Platinum standard, a decorative as well as functional outer skin, made a lot of sense. It absorbs a lot of the radiant heat coming from the sun and at the same time protects the lower levels of the perform the insulation and waterproofing functions in the roof build-up, so they don't get too hot. It also protects them from damage and clogging up with sand as well. There's a number of challenges that we have to do to bring all the various parties together. There's a number of subcontractors, and we all have to work in the same sequence at the right time to make all those things happen because it's like dominoes. You've got to do one thing before you can do the next, etc. So there's a lot of preliminary work in terms of first fix mechanical and electrical works that need to go in the ceiling voids, which will allow us to go drop down under the raised floor. We install the raised floor. In terms of the design challenges, the layers that you see are the ones that do all the work. So these layers are the ones that insulate the building 
and they also keep the water out of the building and provide air tightness, which is a big issue in this part of the world because the dust here is so very, very fine. Uh, we tend to go through laptops here far quicker than we would, you know, in, in Northern Europe, just because of the fine, the fine dust that's in the atmosphere. The project is completely based book. There is nothing have already been done before with the same level of details required by the architect. Every single profile you see in front of you right now have already been built up specifically for the job itself. It is not ready-made, it does not come from the shop. The level of quality which have been required by Zah Hadid for the final finished product itself, very high level. And most of the elements still have already been painted more than three or four times. So the calculation work was really quite painful process to be able to reach the quiet level of details what they want. Normal structure and steel work, I would never come and inspect it. This, by comparison, is of the highest possible quality. So the surface finish is nice and matte and it's consistent, which is, which is the good news. Yeah, we spent ages to reach that. Yeah, I think yeah. It's fine. It looks as if the, um, the fillets are all the right size as well. This is the third time the guys have done that. That's, so I that's think they pretty, nailed it this time. That's pretty good. There is, however, I see there's a little bit of like a snail trail snail on the surface trail. here. You see that? You know, just there. And then over here, it starts from the edge and then seems to migrate across the top surface. And maybe if we check this other node here, Ah, uh, yeah, you see, we've got it here. You see all these 45 degree hairs? Uh, yeah, okay. We have it here. That kind of points the finger to this shrink wrap. Yeah, it's on this one as well. Okay, it's fine. Anyway, if we have to spray it, we have to respray the whole piece. So we cannot leave the patches in. Check all of the nodes. Can we remove all the wrapping? Yeah. and then we will just uh, recheck it and if we have to yeah. do it, we have to make one clear code yeah. again. And maybe we don't use this. I will check with them if we can change different kind of plastic wrap. Maybe bubble wrap this yeah. time. Shrink wrap's okay for my sandwiches in the morning but before I come to work, steel. but maybe not for architectural okay. metal work. Here we're going for fully matte paint. So any slight reflection in the paint surface becomes very visible. So yet again, it has to be repainted. Within 15 years of experience, I have never seen such level of acceptance criteria like what you have here in the airport. We're gonna bring in the external walls and fill up these large apertures with glazing. So we put some aluminum box sections in there to create mullions put the glazing in that big arch section, for example. It's a Zaha Hadid project. As it is known that whatever Zaha Hadid architect's work is one of its kind. It has got a lot of curves to it. It has been not easy for us to adapt to that curved nature. There's 2,500 square meters of glass on this project with nearly 1,000 pieces, which are all triangular shape and with different sizes. To add on to it, we need to insulate the glass. So that means you would bring two glasses together and seal it so that you get the optimum performance on the insulated glass. That would reduce the sound, that would reduce the light, and it would give you light control. So the safety standard on this project is the highest in the industry. So the next big hurdles for the design team in terms of coordination is the GRP. The GRP is the plastics and it's a moulded surface that is basically installed like cladding um, internally. So it's almost like an external facade that we're, that we're building inside, which is something I've never done before, which is really exciting. The one material that we haven't used extensively before on any of our projects is GRP. GRP is a highly moldable material. It's used for boats, and it's also used in the construction industry. What we're trying to do with it on, in this project is use it for internal walls and ceilings, and that the GRP is actually 
clad with a timber veneer, so you won't see the GRP. It will appear as a complex curved timber element rather than as a piece of GRP. We will just start with the GRP activity now. We have around 2,800 panels to be installed, and every single unit is different, is unique. We are talking around more than 12,000 pieces between GRP and GRC. And the panel weights here are heavy. Consider that it's like an average of a 350 kg. Also, you have a difficulties in the installation, the safety requirement here, you need to maintain it for all the parts, engineering, production, and installation. The shape of the building is extremely complicated. The geometry of the shape of each and every GRP panel is different. We cannot use any machine technology or anything to stick the veneer. This shape has to be done manually, one by one, piece by piece. This is the biggest challenge we had it here. The GRP based material is a fire rated material, but the veneer is a natural wood which cannot be fire rated. So we brought special kind of glue and we got a top coat paint which is fire resistant. So it took us a long process to achieve this fire rating. This is the first time we have such requirement for the delivery. The other problem with something like GRP is, once you cast it, you can't do anything with it. It's not like gypsum. Gypsum, if it's in the wrong place, you can cut it, you can fill it. GRP, you can. If it's wrong, cast another one. And obviously that's expensive because you've just trashed the mold. Similarly, the GRC on the outside, again, complex forms, you need to make a mold, cast the, the concrete, in the mold, so it's a very complex process. There's been a lot of progress, as you can see behind me, and this building will be one of the smartest as well as one of the most sustainable buildings in the region, which reflects BS DNA and BS vision to be a leader in sustainability and digitalization. So we've worked very hard in, uh, with our partners, Microsoft and Johnson Control, in terms of making this one of the first fully integrated AI buildings. So a lot of work needed to be done in putting the infrastructure uh, for that to happen. We want the building to have an ideal workplace environment and to reflect um, this idea of the office of the future. We are employing a lot of latest technologies and systems for workplaces that are considered innovative but also employing technologies that will be relevant in two years' time, which is when um, the building is going to be completed. The building initially wanted to go for LEED, L-E-E-D, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Rating System, for a gold status. When Buru Happel Engineering got involved, we started talking to the client and started looking for more opportunities of how the building could be pushed further to go to the highest lead rating. But the next question was, how can we do more? And that's when the conversation came of net zero energy. And that's when the Tesla battery idea came in that, oh, why don't we use a battery storage? That's the point we informed the client there is an opportunity to connect the building with a living building challenge. It will be the first building in the region to be certified as an S0 building with PV supporting 100% energy generation and Tesla batteries as a backup. It's like pushing really the boundaries and creating something truly unique, truly transformation and truly a beacon of sustainability for the region and especially for Sharjah. So in September 2018, the concrete structure was effectively completed. Uh, at that time, we had the steel structure also finished. It was ready to receive the roof, which are the EWS01 GRC panels. There was a lot of prevailing challenges at the time, and to a degree which continued due to the complexity and the nature of the project itself. Uh, a constraint at that point in time was being able to load the structure itself. We had to do a deflection analysis to be able to predict the movements and tolerances once those concrete panels were placed onto the roof. There has been frustrations, there continues to be frustrations, but the entire project team is focused on moving forward and keeping the progress going. Time pressure is one of the biggest challenges for us as a, as a project team at the moment. We're doing everything we can as a team to complete the works in, in the quickest possible time. Like the rest of the world, we've all been affected by the effects of this pandemic. Fortuitously, we have now brought the full team back to strength. 
We have put in place here a number of really key health and safety measures with social distancing, sanitation tunnels that you've seen, hand sanitation stations throughout, and a lot of communication posters and awareness. So these matters are taken very seriously here. But now we're back on site. Really, the key now is to start driving this project to the finish line. It's been very challenging overall along the years, but right now it's you know closer to the finish line. So people are put under massive pressure to finalize things on site. Sometimes you know you need to make fast decisions and. Um, we do that by just focusing all of our efforts to find solutions that are fast and quick, and that can also adapt um, to the building overall intent. And as you can see today, the uh, site is pretty moving full-fledged uh, with all of the external works. We've managed to enclose the building, get the uh, external skin up, and now we've got the roads works that are progressing, the curbs works, as well as the dune structures, which we've got 29 of them, and each one is significant or unique in terms of its surface and its geometry. Another important element of the works is the completion and the installation of the PV farm, which is integrated with the execution of the Tesla batteries. And we've achieved certain milestones, and we've got yet one more with the complete integration within the private energy network to achieve. The, the project is currently at a, at a stage where the, the floor is almost complete. There are some final things within the floor and below the floor which need to be completed. One of those things is the floor plenum air tightness test. Now that is a test within below the floor to make sure that the floor is airtight. What has been happening on the, the project when they did the initial tests, there were lots of leaks all over the place. So these unintentional air leakages are causing a lower amount of conditioned air to enter the space, which means cooling and, and ventilation will not be provided. One of the, the real big concerns is delaying other works from, from happening. So all of these tests are happening below the raised access floor, which means that the elements on top of the raised access floor, such as carpets, such as stone tiles, cannot be finished. Um, furniture cannot be, be brought in and, and placed into, onto the floors. Very much hoping that there will be a, a successful outcome at the end, that the leaks will be identified the leaks will be rectified and we will pass the air tightness criteria. We have uh, an incredible um, LED installation on the main roof of the, of, of the headquarters here. We're able to put light shows and run in various events here at the headquarters for Biha. We've had a couple of great examples of late with the National Day. We did a fantastic celebration for the clients with the roof lit up, really to showcase the, the capability of the building's roof lighting system. It was actually uh, very, very challenging to design a lighting design for this kind of building because the building is very organic and very unique and every single panel on the building has a different dimension than the next one. So in order to design a lighting suitable for that, we had to customize profiles that are as big as each panel separately. So we have here around 4,800 profiles of different sizes. Each one of them is exactly the same size of the panel. So we worked on a lot of integration, a lot of coordination with the whole team to come up with this. So the air leak test is finally successful after several iterations and uh, solutions that were developed by the whole team. So now we're able to install the remaining panels which will enable us to do the flooring and uh, do the final finishes and installation of the furniture. We are in the most critical phase of the project where design becomes real. Starting from the interior design process to the FFE selection, everything has been completely tailor-made for the client. We design the elements, thinking of the soft lines of the desert, the curves of the building, the space, thinking of sustainability, ergonomy, and technology. So in every single place of the office, we specifically provided a custom design furniture in order to enhance the quality of spaceness that we have here and to blend with the environment. 
We've allowed about three to four weeks time and that's working around the clock again as we're into this final phase to install the furniture. A lot of the furniture has come from Italy, so we have you know, quite a significant range of different furniture pieces, sizes, shapes to fit the rooms. Biggest challenge really for the furniture on the first floor specifically is its 500 kilo Zaha Deed uh, designed desk. The physical elevator couldn't have handled the weight. The only option really was to take that piece, unbox it and manually carry it up the stairs. That involves a lot of planning, a lot of men, a lot of manpower, uh, a lot of coordination to make that happen. We're finally done. We're really excited for the opening and relieved that we have completed all of the construction works and we're ready for the opening that's happening during this week. It's a proud moment. It's a moment where we've all been waiting for. It's a happy moment for me to see people enjoying the space and to come in and tell me time passes so quickly in this building because they're enjoying the different facilities that we've provided. The moment I enter the building, the first thing that came into my mind is spaceship. I've never seen something like it. I am very proud and happy that I am actually a part of this organization that have developed such an incredible monument, I can say. When I am happy, when I am comfortable in the space that I'm working at, naturally the productivity level will also rise. To us, this is a new beginning because this building allows us to appreciate architecture that merges with technology and culture. And I'm really lucky to be a part of this journey. Being able to be part of every single design stage has been the dream of a lifetime. It has been the project of a lifetime. And I believe that anybody would be envious to, to have had that chance, and I'm extremely honored. Without that collaborative approach, without everybody putting in their expertise and ensuring that this was the best building possible, then nothing would have been able to, to have come to life. I feel a sense of relief but also a bittersweet moment because the whole team that, you know, we've been like a family working on this project for so long. But it's also a sense of pride that we actually finally got to the finish line and we achieved what we, what we had envisioned from the very start. I think the most valuable lesson I've learned is that there's nothing impossible. You just need to be persistent about what you believe in and there'll always be a way. The team worked very hard, you know, it's an iconic building, it's a building very hard to build, and they were able to achieve the vision that we had. This shows that, you know, if you have a vision and you work towards it, we can achieve a lot. VR will continue pioneering sustainability quality of life in the MENA region. And we are just at the beginning.